Okay, we'll reconvene the meeting. Um, call the meeting to order and uh, start by doing the Pledge of Allegiance. Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Start to see you there. You know how David Letterman feels. You gotta. <laughs> That's right. No, no, no. Sorry. That's fine. <laughs> um, we'll start. Any public comment? Anyone interested in any topics? I guess I have a comment since you're asking. Sure. Um, hi, my name is Josh Martin. I live on Lincoln Avenue. And I've been seeing all this about six years. And I've noticed that despite all the money we've spent on, on sidewalks and downtown improvements, which are great, uh, I've seen a decline in the quality of life. It's gotten a lot noisier since I moved here. It seems like there's a lot, a lot more dogs parking in the neighborhood. And there's a lot more uh, people rolling coal down the street. Um, I know one time I had friends visiting, I took them to Twig to sit on the sidewalk. And they were commenting about what a beautiful city it was, and they were so surprised how much it had changed in 20 years. And then a couple of diesel trucks go by with their, you know, whistle tips and a big cloud of black smoke, and they're, you know, they're not going to come back and sit on the sidewalk again. So I think that's something to keep in mind. With, with all the money that we're spending, there's a lot of stuff we could do that, that wouldn't cost as much money that I think would get a lot more people to come into downtown and to live here, to not move away. Uh, so that's quality of life, noise, that's all. I think, uh, I think noise pollution is a, it's something that's becoming more recognized as, a, as something that's injurious to people's health, uh, especially with the, well, that's all, I'll leave it at that. No, Thank you. I, I appreciate that. Um, that's a, I mean, I've been on the, council for three months and I think it's come up at pretty much every meeting the, the noise factor Chad and I just spoke about it prior to the prior to the meeting outside when we were chatting so it is a it's it's a concern of the council as well so we appreciate you bringing that uh, what the solution is I'm not quite sure but we will continue to discuss it and see what we can come up with but thank you for thank you for the comments um, chip you want to come forth? Thank you. Second reading of amendments proposed for the land development regulations. These concern dwelling unit rules for our business districts. Um, I'll just summarize the changes first and then we can do questions and answers and comments. Um, in uh, the first change is suggested for section 304 and if you remember from the last meeting section 304 is a very user-friendly table that quickly shows you which uses are allowed in which district in the city but because of its simplicity it's not very explanatory and so we're suggesting that we add text before the table in that section that says all right this is what the table means this is what all the little abbreviations mean and the letters and everything and that's how you interpret the table um, and then when you go to the top of the second page of the proposal, you'll see it's an actual excerpt from that table. And this is our first suggestion to change the policy governing dwelling units in the business districts. We have, um, we have a rule right now uh, that in the business, in the central business district, B1, you are permitted to have residential on the first floor of a building if the rest of the building is all used for residential and it's outside the historic district and we um, also apply that rule to the b2 district but then as you see further down there are these other residential multiple family dwelling duplex single family dwelling that also apply to the b2 district and it was getting confusing which rules apply in the b2 and we are proposing another way of handling the residential in the B1. So we've struck those lines entirely. We'll let those three lines that stay intact govern the B2. And then you'll see in this um, 
big cell under the B1 column, it says C section 304B, and that is a new section that we've proposed further down in, in this proposal. Actually, that's the next thing that comes up. Basically, uh, the rules have been very strong about not allowing residential on the first floor in the B1 district within the historic district, but letting it be permitted outside the historic district. And the Planning Commission and staff, they're shooting for something more in the middle, where it is allowed in the historic district. And it's still allowed outside the historic district, but it, is now, it would now be a conditional use in all cases under this proposal. So that any time you're proposing uh, a residential use that includes all or a portion of dwelling units on the first floor of a building, you'd come before the DRB. And you'd be able to prov provide a character of the area analysis as part of that conditional use review. Where if it's, if it's obviously one of the historic homes, we still have a couple in the historic district, or if it's a, st a historic home or multifamily outside the historic district in the B1, yeah, it's probably going to pass conditional use approval to be residential throughout the building. But if it's a traditionally historic retail storefront, we could apply character to the area and say that's more likely to benefit the city and meet the character of the area by remaining in some sort of commercial or retail use. But residential could be elsewhere in the building or in another property nearby that, that is more residential in nature. There is also um, only one and this is the, this kind of hints at the last change, but 304B takes care of this. There is only one minimum lot size requirement in the B1 district. And it is a very weird rule. Um, it existed when I came on board. And the only restriction in the B1 is that you can only have one dwelling unit per 2,000 feet, uh, 2,000 square feet of lot size, regardless of the height of the building, for new construction. But you can have as many offices as you want, and you can put as many apartments as you want inside rehab construction. Although there's a point in which you might rehab an old building and it starts to look like new construction. And it's a, it's a confusing rule, it's ambiguous, it's very gray in many situations, and we don't know where the 2,000 square feet came from. If it was trying to avoid um, leading to living spaces that are too cramped, there are many other ways that that could inadvertently happen in a, in, a, in a development and still be in compliance with the rule the way it's written. So what we did in this new proposal for 304B is the same thing we're doing for residential on the first floor, making it a deliberate con conversation that happens in front of the DRB. If someone wants to propose dwelling units in the B1 district that are in compliance with all other rules, and there would be l less than one, or one or less dwelling units per 2,000 square feet on the lot, then it's permitted. But if you want to have more dwelling units than one per 2,000 square feet on the lot, you would have to come before the DRB and just have that conversation out with them. There's also a rule, finally, at the bottom. The Planning Commission at this point feels we shouldn't be allowing a lot of duplex and single-family homes for a lot in the historic district. They expect to see a higher density of use if the use is going to be residential, so right now, in the historic district, it's limited to multifamily, which would be three or more units. And then finally, the last proposal on the last page is we just strike out that um, minimum lot size rule for the B1. You can see it in that, in that column. And we've specified that there's no minimum lot size required. But all the other rules that apply to development in the B1 would apply. And we haven't had minimum lot sizes for any other use in the B1 for quite a while. And so the Planning Commission and staff are comfortable with that change. And we think it leads to a more um, a process that will better take into account character of the area, but also allow development where it's appropriate. Thank you, Chip. Any questions for Chip? Were we looking at some particular projects? Will we change these? Or? Are there some particular issues that we're looking at, like the new, maybe the new construction that's going on here on the corner or something on, going on on Federal Street? Are we looking at any particular situations that prompted these? These changes commission? have been on the list that the Planning Commission is looking at. Um, and one of the reasons why we're bringing this now is because it does have to do with the, um, the new apartments that are proposed for 10 Maiden Lanes, where we realize that 
now we're starting to see where, where these rules would have a detrimental effect, and so it's time to bring this proposal now. Yeah. Um, that because of when these rules were warned for the, city, for the first city council hearing, and when a property owner on Federal Street brought forward an application for dwelling units that would include the first floor, that became the first instance where, um, where an applicant had to bring his application before the DRB for, for that conditional use review. There's a rule in, in the state's enabling statute for zoning that says that uh, when you warn a change, any application that comes in after that point has to be considered as if that change were in effect. And so we follow that rule for that application. Any other questions? Um, I'll move that we adopt the amendments to the land development regulations on dwelling units in business districts as presented. Second. Mm -hmm. Motion by Michael, seconded by Kate. Any other questions or discussion? Hearing none, all in favor say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Thank Motion you. passes. And you're going to be touching on the stormwater operations and management ordinance. Yes, yeah, second reading on our um, proposed stormwater operations and management ordinance which would create a stormwater utility and would um, implement some stormwater regulations that are required by our MS4 permit. Since the first reading, we did um, apply a legal review to the ordinance. So there have been some process changes, but no policy changes um, to the uh, to what was presented for the first reading. We've eliminated some redundancies in process. We've eliminated some defined terms that uh, actually no longer show up in the document. There were some areas where we've referenced other city statutes to govern the uh, how we deal with late fees, for instance, and legal counsel thought that that probably didn't fly. If, if we wanted to have that stand for this ordinance, it should be in this ordinance. And we also inserted um, state rules, associated state rules that apply to whether or not you can tax sale late fees in the case of uh, stormwater. We also updated all of the references to the city charter and enabling state statutes throughout the document. Um, furthermore, we made process changes that put everything um, under the coordination of the administrative officer. And there were parts where the development review board was specifically named because in many cases, applications that need to deal with erosion control or post construction stormwater management under these rules would be part of a zoning application before the DRB. Legal counsel felt that the DRB is going to be involved under the land development regulations. Uh, the administrative coordinator will make sure that they are involved to the degree they need to be, and there was no reason to add them in and, and make the process pieces of this ordinance more, um, more complicated. The effect would be the same uh, by just naming the administrative officer. The administrative officer, by the way, could be uh, more than one person. They would, uh, under this proposal, the administrative officer for any piece of this ordinance to carry out the uh, illicit connections to the stormwater system versus who carries out um, dealing with erosion on construction projects. It could be different people based on existing city staff that already deal with uh, similar functions. For instance, it's most likely public works that will be dealing with detecting the illicit connections to the stormwater system. It could be me or Dave Southwick that is the administrative officer for the items where we're regulating development. And part of the reason why we would have a utility is that uh, we would also be able to use um, outside technical resources when necessary. Um, but just quickly to summarize chapter by chapter what's in the ordinance. Um, 
Chapter 1 contains the purposes and definitions. I think the purposes of what we're doing here are pretty familiar, familiar to everyone now. We all know what's happening to our streams and what's happening to the bay. And we know that stormwater uh, runoff can be a form of pollution in the city and that something needs to be done about it and that it eventually gets to the bay. Uh, we also know that our MS4 permit has various different requirements that we must meet and the stormwater utility is being proposed as the a form of revenue that has the best nexus to dealing with the city's obligations in water quality. Administration, um, chapter two, that's where we talk about the administrative officer, the appointment process. Chapter three, the illicit detection, uh, illicit discharge detection and elimination, IDDE we call it, that's where we would, you know, we still have some cases where something's getting into the separated stormwater lines. You can detect it at the outfalls when it comes into the streams. And this program would, as a permit requirement, be where we go and look for cases like that and we just basically follow it up the stormwater line until we find out if someone's inadvertently dumping something into a drain or someone's sewer connection for some reason just was never disconnected from a stormwater line and uh, this would allow us to um, more vigorously find those potential forms of pollution. Chapter 4 is just about the what the city needs in terms of being able to monitor discharges Chapter five is erosion and sediment control. We basically need to use um, the, the state's low risk erosion control handbook, which is an illustrated guide that you can use on any construction site. And we would just start using that when development comes through the, uh, the permitting office and start to tell folks about how they need to make sure that sediment on a project um, does not erode off of the site and become pollution. There are exemptions for gardening, for single family home work, duplex work, and that sort of thing. Chapter six is the post-construction stormwater management, and this would only be for projects that disturb more than an acre. So it would be for large projects that it would be seldom, but this is actually where, um, this is another permit requirement where we would, um, fulfill a federal rule that the state's program does not currently fulfill the way it's designed, but that the EPA still wants any development that disturbs more than an acre to have to deal with stormwater pollution after the development is done. So part of the development would be installing whatever would treat runoff from the site from that point forward. And we would uh, basically just make sure that the state's stormwater manual is applied to, to developments of that size. Chapter eight is a self-explanatory document about construction, waste, and debris. Chapter nine is about enforcement. Um, it's enforcement measures that are very similar to other enforcement measures that the city um, carries out. Chapter 10, the stormwater system user fees is where we establish, establish the stormwater utility as a fee-based form of revenue. Um, we would use the model used by many, many other stormwater utilities and all the utilities in the state thus far to establish um, an average equivalent residential unit. It's the average impervious square footage that you'd find on a single family home or a duplex. And then we sort of apply that number to all other um, properties in the city. <clears throat> it's, like, it's like the EUs that we have for uh, water and wastewater. One EU is 450 gallons a day. So in our case of stormwater, one ERU is 3,000 square feet of impervious. And basically what we're proposing the city council does is it um, passes a stormwater utility budget in the same manner that you do the water and wastewater budgets. And then based on the impervious cover on the various properties in the city, um, you would set the ERU rate based on how much money the utility needs and um, what the impervious cover is on properties in the city. We believe at this point that <clears throat> with an ERU of um, $2.50 per 3,000 square feet of impervious per month, that would meet the current proposed stormwater utility budget that we will bring before the Finance Committee, along with the water and wastewater budgets. Um, chapter 11 deals with the appeals process, which is a 
pretty common to other city functions and how they can be appealed. Chapter 12 sets the effective date of this, the regulations and the formation of the, util the utility as July 1st of 2018. So a question about the appeals. Five days seems pretty short. Is that what's standard? So it says that after you rule or whoever the whoever rules, they have five days. So if you send a letter on Friday, you receive it on Monday, but they're on vacation for that week. They come back the following weekend. By Monday, they've surpassed the five days. We could extend it. I didn't say usually it's 14 or 30 days, isn't it? You could it? use the 15. Um, 15 oh. seems a little better. Are you wed to a certain number? I'm not wed to yeah. any number. I just see five days seems pretty. 15 is the number that we use for a, when put, someone puts a yellow card up on their property for a permit for a garage or yep. something. So. That'll work. That's better. Yeah. yeah. Any other questions? I had, I had two quick ones, Chip. How, how are you looking to promote this and educate the citizens of it? Because it's July 1's coming up fairly quick. Um, yeah, there is going to have to be um, all sorts of different outreach because we're going to have to start letting uh, people know about the new stormwater and erosion rules when they come in for a permit. And so we'll, Dave will probably get to work on, on announcements and, and um, informational pieces on that. And then um, for the formation of the utility so that people know to look for uh, some changes to their water and sewer bill, we'll use a combination of social media. We can send letters out in the water and sewer bills. Actually, because of the timing of the approval of this ordinance and when water and sewer bills go out, we'll... Um, we'll have a little bit of time before people will, will actually first be billed for um, their stormwater fee. So that will be more time to get the word out before they actually re actually see the fee on one of their bills. The water and sewer bills go out next month. And we, um, with this not starting until July 1st, we wouldn't start billing until the water sewer bills that go out in September. And the other question I had was, is the town doing something similar to this? Are you working with Ned? Are there any synergies between the two? Is there, I mean, there are properties that obviously abut. We're not actively coordinating on how revenues will be raised. I have heard in conversations with town staff that it's likely they might um, create a special form of revenue for their stormwater activities but I don't know what their plans are. I don't uh, know what they're gonna propose. I wasn't even thinking as much as a fees, but just um, process and... Yes. The town and the city have been at many meetings together. When we talk to DEC, we're normally all sitting in the room. We, um, the plans that we've come up for, for the stormwater treatment for flow restoration, those have always been joint documents. The city and town, Rugg and Stevens. And, you know, I don't wanna, get out too far ahead of the council or, or the city manager but or the town but I think it's it's likely that there could be areas of coordination in terms of what projects are ultimately pursued in the greater community to meet our watershed goals okay. any other questions uh, I wanted to ask just in terms of the way that this will appear on people's bills is as a separate light line item quarterly on there so we um, we will simply add a line to your water and sewer bill. It says stormwater fee. Uh, we already have the, the capacity and the um, facilities to, to, we already do utility billing. So that'll be a relatively simple piece of the process. But there will have to be a substantial customer service ability on our part when we roll this thing out. There are going to be questions. We're going to discover things we didn't know about someone's impervious. There's a process in here for reassessing someone's impervious if they think we're in error. Um, and there's a way to retroactively credit people. There's also, if, if, you, um, if you notice, <clears throat> there's a list of documents incorporated by reference. Some of the other things we'll still have to bring before the council, like the stormwater budget, will also be the fee credit manual, so people would know how they could treat stormwater on their property to get a credit for a fee if they so choose. And there's the guidance for the erosion control rules that um, we'll be bringing before you as well. But like I said, it will be 
you know, the backbone of it will be the state's existing uh, very nice illustrated guide on controlling erosion on, on uh, construction sites. Okay. <laughs> Entertain a motion. Any public comment? Okay. Oh, sorry. To, yes. Anyone have any public comments on this? Hearing none, I'd entertain a motion. I move that um, we approve the revisions and uh, adoption of the ordinance for the stormwater operation and ma maintenance ordinance with uh, changes to Chapter 11, Section 11.1.B and 11.2.B to change from uh, 5 to 15 days. Second that. Seconded by Michael. Any further discussion? Hearing none, all of those in favor say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? So be it. Chip, Jeb, that's it for you for now. Mm -hmm. Thank you for your time on that, Chip. Nice work. Thank you. I know it's been a long, long process. Now would um, entertain a motion to recess out of the council meeting and move into the liquor control meeting. So moved. So moved by Chad. Second. Second by Kate. All those in favor say aye. 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 So moved. So we're now entering the liquor control meeting. Curry is not here today. Tim's going to take over that portion. Start the discussion. Joining us is Mohammed Omar. Yes. Thank you for coming, making time. Did you enjoy your vacation? We missed you uh, last time. Yeah. <coughs> last time I was on vacation, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Tim? Well, the reason, uh, <clears throat> um, sir, that we had you come in was because of the uh, violation and the infractions that they uh, came in close proximity. And we were just wondering uh, what your plans are to help remedy the situation so that those infractions don't exist anymore. Violation on what? I'm sorry. Uh, the underage smoking. Oh, okay, yeah. yeah. Uh, are we we have a scanning system, so anytime uh, anytime we scan a tobacco product or alcohol product. It gives us a, a pop-up notification for, for the age reminder, just to verify the age. And the last time, the person we just had, she just, she just missed it. Uh, we never really had an issue with that before. So, I mean. That was one time, though. I mean, this was three violations in, uh, I think it was a nine-month period, or you know, plus a year. And that seems like someone's missing the boat somewhere. You agree? It was it three? I'm, I'm sorry. I'm, I wasn't even aware. Yeah, it's three. Yeah, yeah. You don't know? No, I mean I was I was the idle partner. I have a partner who was running the business. Yeah. So the most of the time I was out of out of state. I was in a different state. So I just came back like six months ago. And I was aware of the one that happened uh, four or five months ago, and that was just the guy who just just couldn't add it up. But just when they, you have those violations that are so close in time, mm -hmm. kind of gets our attention. You know? uh, fair enough. Um, we are. I'm trying to get a like a a new system which actually has a which every time uh, somebody buys a tobacco product or alcohol product. So you have to swipe the ID in order to open the register. So I'm just, just in the process of getting a new system anyway. So you, your, uh, your worker would take the ID from the person buying the alcohol or cigarettes, have to swipe it through a, a machine? Machine, yeah. yes, yes. And that only works on uh, state licenses? Yes. Is that, is that a discretionary practice, or is that something they would have to do every time? Like, if I went in no, no, uh, to buy cigarettes, uh, well, and I, I wouldn't, but in case I did, mm -hmm. um, would I be giving you my yes. license? Yes. No matter what my age is? Yeah. Yes. Okay. 
Is that fairly new technology? Uh, yes. Uh, it's, um, it, it, it's, it's been around. It's, it's, it's not like very new. It's, it's been used in markets and uh, like when you go to um, stores like uh, like when you go to Price Shopper, you buy stuff there. They have to scan your IDs just to get those. Just one of those things. So is it just to open the register, or is it to make, to continue with the purchase? So if I was going to pay with my debit card, you wouldn't mm -hmm. have to open the register, would you? Yeah, no. It's basically when you swipe your ID, it it just verify the age on the screen, tells you that it's it's good to. So it won't let you go any further until you do no. that. It won't let you complete the sale. No. no. What if I don't have my ID? Well, then you don't get it. Yeah. Sounds good. Yeah. Any other questions for Mohammed? Tim, are you set? I'm okay. So the next steps, uh, I believe. Next steps, we, uh, we'll, we will. Corey will take care of the application process to uh, make the license permanent until the next. Renewal period. Renewal period. Yeah. So the one you have right now is a temporary one, right? Yeah. That's what it was. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Thank for you for coming there, Mohammed. Thanks for your time. Thank you. Have a good evening. <coughs> so we need to approve the minutes from April 9th. Motion to approve minutes April 9th. Second. Second by Chad. All those in favor say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? So moved. Entertain a motion to adjourn out of the Liquor Control Board meeting. So moved. So moved by Michael. Second. So moved by Kate. And a motion to um, reconvene the City Council meeting. If needed. No, we're there. Not needed. We're, we're there. there. All right. We're there. We're there. It's like Inception. It's a meeting within a meeting. <laughs> now one meeting. We're still in the first meeting. <laughs> Um, so now we move on to appointments to design advisory board. Chip, do you want to lay that out for us? Yes, we have an open seat on the DAB. Uh, we have two candidates. Um, on the council with a memo that has their board applications and um, has a staff recommendation for um, uh, the terms of the new, of the new seats that the council wishes to make appointments. What we have here, John Morgan and Elizabeth Reed. Thank you both for joining us. Uh, thank you also for your interest in participating in city government and on this board. You both can come up here if we want to. My memo has the typical council in the Thank you both. Anyone want to start off? Usually we let you ask the questions. Oh, is that the way it works? <laughs> 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 you don't get off that easy. <laughs> Still learning. Um, so thanks for coming. Um, you know, we, we did get your uh, paperwork. Thank you for taking the time to fill that out. I guess um, we'll start with uh, Elizabeth. Um, this would be new for city government for you. Um, and we saw a little bit on your interest. Um, could you elaborate on that a little bit, on why you? Yeah, certainly. Um, I'm coming at this um, from a homecoming. I recently attended four years of college as an art major. And uh, the community I was in was a lot like downtown is now. It has a lot of um, art history, has a lot of general history. Um, and I want to preserve that image of Um And where do you live? I thought it was on your... Um, like my physical address? Yeah. Uh, A.A. Wiley Place. It's up off from High Street. Right. Donnie, you've been on the board, I think, for four years. Is that correct? I believe it's been four years, yes. Do you want to touch on why you, you haven't had enough? Um, why you want to come back? Well, it's not that I have I, I, I do enjoy the board. I think we've made some great progress within the city. Guided a lot of people to get to the point where we are. Um, I would actually 
if the council would like it, I would actually like to be just an alternate, um, give somebody else a chance to sit on, sit on the board and their blood and get some, get some different guidance maybe. Um, I would probably still make most of the meetings. Um, other than that, as most of you know, there's a personal thing going on at home and there might come a time where I might have to spend a lot of time at home and I don't want to have the have to say relying on me when I can't be there. Appreciate that. Um. So you what experience in your background have influenced you? So you touched on the art piece, Elizabeth. Is there anything else other than maybe school? Yeah, certainly. Um, I've grown up in St. Albans all my life. I was born and raised here. So are my parents, my grandparents. Um, and I have a lot of great memories of downtown as a kid. And I feel like that, those have changed. And I want to give other people better memories. Um, I haven't had the greatest memories. My mother owns a business downtown. And so I've been able to see a lot of the business. Okay. Johnny, you're obviously your construction background yeah. plays um, a role in that. Been building for 40 plus years, business management degree, civil engineering degree, so it just kind of fit when the, when the board reconvened uh, four years ago. I applied and was chosen, so I just thought it was a way I could get back to the city and my knowledge that I've obtained over the last three years. Okay. Um, we'll start with you, John. Just how do you view the board working now? What are the qualities that makes it, do you view it as a successful board? And what, you know, that's from your experience, and then Elizabeth will talk about just in general what you think makes a successful board. I, I do do it as a very successful, successful board. I think that we have a lot of good discussions. Um, most of the projects that come before us are pretty much past right then at that meeting. There's been maybe a half a dozen that we've tabled for, for more information and whatnot because the people just weren't quite ready. Uh, but for the most part, most of the projects get approved, whether to go forward with what they've done right to their permit or to pass it on to the DRB so that they can make the final decisions because they're outside of the scope of what the DAB can, you know, what, they, what, what we can tell them to do, right. what we can tell them not to do. So Elizabeth, vision of a successful board. A lot of that is communication, being able to communicate with one another and come together to better the community, not you know coming in with personal vendettas. Do you have the, um, how familiar are you with the board? Um, and John, this might be easier for you to answer, but what would be your vision moving forward for the board? Is there anything um, you think they can be a little more proactive on? Gosh, um, we've actually discussed that at board meetings. Had you know maybe getting a little better on researching the projects before you come into the meetings. A uh, little better discussions, although I think we have some really good discussions on on each project. Um, but there's always room for improvement, and. Pretty much every meeting we talk about how we can improve mm -hmm. different things, what we can do to improve, and guidelines. What can we make better guidelines for us so that we have a better way of, you know, better way of passing these presented projects. So, but overall, I think it's, I think we've done some good work. Okay. Elizabeth, your vision moving forward? Uh, my vision for the board. Um, Cultural and environmental sustainability. I have some ideas. Um, you know, white, white roads. It's kind of weird, but um, painting, physically painting ro a road after you put the asphalt down, um, will reduce the temperature and therefore would um, keep the street or the street cooler for the buildings to help preserve them. 
What color would you paint them? White. Oh, white. Okay. <laughs> I didn't miss that part. Black. Black. Yeah, paint them black. <laughs> um, any other questions? Chad? Um, hmm? Marie, your uh -huh. sense? I move to appoint um, Elizabeth Reed to the open seat expiring um, on April 20th or April 30th, 2021, and uh, John Morey to an alternate position also expiring April 30th, 2021. Second. Second, Second by Kate. It's okay, Kate. Kate Beach, <laughs> Any uh, other discussion? If not, all those in favor say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Motion passes. Johnny, thank you for your service over the last years, and thank you for your willingness to be an alternate. And Elizabeth, thank you for stepping up and filling that role. So thank you both. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good evening. Thank you. Good luck. Chip, you're back. Uh, consider a grant agreement for a resolution. <clears throat> You may remember we went to the Vermont Community Development Program for an application um, to uh, secure some monies for Champlain Housing Trust to keep running their low-income home repair loan program. Organizations have to go through a municipality to get to VCDP funds, and so they asked us if we would be their sponsor in this case. We were awarded $635,000. It goes towards their program. It's a regional program, not just in the city, but I think it could get a lot of use in the city, and overall it's a good program. And we have within our you know, department budget and our staff the, the capability of dealing with the administrative piece of, of this grant. So uh, one of the steps necessary before we sign the agreement with the Vermont Community Development Program is that the city council pass this um, grant agreement resolution, which names me as the administrator and names um, Dom as the uh, authorizing official. And there it is. I have a copy of the agreement. I think it went out in your emails, but I do have a copy of their mm -hmm. very long agreement. <coughs> mm -hmm. Chip, just for, if you would just remind us on some of the terms on these loans, because um, this would actually be a grant. A grant. Right, but when they go back out, because um, I, I Oh, the program itself, yes. It's home run, and it's really how to get some. It is. So obviously, you know, it is, because this is HUD, HUD money, there is um, an income uh, sensitivity to this program. It is for people who specifically have uh, low incomes based on the median family, um, and median household income in the county. And normally people can actually defer payment on the loans until the property is sold. So that allows, it makes it even more likely that someone would be able to uh, take this money for the purposes of fixing up their home. And in a case in which they probably would have no other means of, of um, making some of the maintenance and other repairs necessary to keep living in these homes. So like Dom said, it's, it's a home run um, for properties that that um, where the property owners don't quite have the means and and they need to make some repairs. So it's not uh, that money that's awarded is not specific to Champlain housing properties. It's open to anyone. The uh, program's open to anyone. Well, and it's a perfect marriage with our public health and safety ordinance and our efforts to clean up the neighborhoods. I mean, this. It's something that the city staff can bring. When we find there's an issue with a property that's distressed in some way, this is one of the tools that we can right. bring to help, no, it's a great idea. help the people deal with the situation. Mm -hmm. So this question might be for Tom. So Tom, um, and my guess is we're doing an A133 audit as it is. We have enough federal funds. This, oh, yeah, yeah. this, doesn't, this isn't going to Im impact that cost at all because we're already paying for it, right? Right. Yeah. We don't, we don't pay these bills until we get the cash. Um, so from, from a parent perspective, it's, it's an easy, easy uh, program for the city. Good. But yeah, we do the federal order every year. Yeah, so one more, one more grant doesn't make a difference. Yeah. Good. Any other questions for Chip? All those in favor of the resolution? 
You want to, uh, Excuse me. I, I take a motion, motion for uh, mm -hmm. motion to approve the resolution. I move we uh, approve the grant agreement resolution for VCDP with Champlain Housing Trust. Is there a second? Second, second by Marie. Any other questions? All those in favor say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Motion passes. Thank you, Chip. Might as well stay seated, I guess. So Chip's going to touch on the city's tree program. Yeah, thanks for this opportunity. Um, you know, St. Albans City loves its trees. And um, some of our trees have been allowed to misbehave and we're, you know, dealing with them. And then in many other cases, you'll see we're planting a lot of trees. Um, I'll start with, uh, in 2015, we uh, received a tree survey for, for city trees in the right-of-way by the uh, Urban um, Community Forestry Program, which includes UVM Extension and Vermont Forest Parks and Recreation and the U.S. Forest Service. And this was a... This produced a, uh, a great report and a large data file of <clears throat> trees by species, by their size, by whether or not they should be looked at because they might be in peril, um, but also places where in the city Greenbelt, in the city right away, where there could be more trees. And so we've been using this inventory as a way to um, track trees to watch out for but it's also something we've started updating as the city um, removes trees and as the city adds trees. Right now, uh, Dave Southwick, in the, permanent, uh, the property services administrator, has carried on a um, tree removal permit process that was first created by our former tree board in Curtis Comfort. So the way the process works is that every time public works or anyone needs to take down a city tree, they fill out a permit with Dave where it states where the tree was, some of the reasons for why it was taken down, but it's also just a good way of us tracking which trees have come down and tracking that on the inventory. And then we also track when trees are installed. Right now there are two major tree planting programs. One is the neighborhood sidewalk project because unfortunately um, when a new sidewalk goes in, and you have a, a mature tree right next to the sidewalk, probably closer than it should be, and not where we'd put a tree today, we can severely disrupt its roots with the sidewalk work. The tree itself could also harm the new infrastructure that we're putting in. So everyone knows that, you probably noticed by now that during a sidewalk project, we will take some trees down. Well, the sidewalk, the sidewalk project also does its best to put trees back in the right place. And the other program is, is run out of the property services office, and that's just a regular green belt <clears throat> tree planting program. Oftentimes based on where we've had to take down trees elsewhere in the city for various different reasons, and also sometimes because someone has said they would like a tree and they've called us, and then we've also paid attention to where the inventory says there is space for trees in the city. Um, I believe in, you know, this spring we're planning 18 greenbelt trees and we're replacing uh, three trees that just haven't thrived in the downtown area. Last year we put 19 new trees in Houghton Park and there was one tree replacement on the downtown streetscape. The year before that we put five trees downtown and 15 trees in the greenbelt. So I don't have the data actually on which one, which one of, which, uh, how many of these are one-to-one -one replacement of the trees that we're taking down and how many are actually new trees. We could get that data in the future. but. We um, basically try to follow some principles. A tree for a tree, whenever a tree comes down, we try to put another tree back. But we also have to follow the principle of having the right tree in the right place. There are many places where trees have done well by some chance, but it's like three trees within six feet of each other in a three foot green belt where we just would not plant a tree today and expect it to have a good chance of thriving. So sometimes when we do a tree for a tree, we need to find a place nearby to put the new tree. And also, if there are utility lines involved, that would, that would affect that species of tree we choose. We normally choose the low growers 
for uh, spaces that are under utility lines. And then we choose the high growers for the spaces that are free of overhead utilities. And that just means that in the future, taking the long view, we're less likely to have to prune the heck out of a tree because it's growing into someone's cable line or growing into the power line. Um, the other thing we, we need to do uh, that we follow is we plan for diversity in the tree cover. Uh, we are the Maple City. Everyone wants a maple. But as you can see in the inventory, more than half of the city's trees are maple. And we need to avoid a situation like what we experienced with Dutch elm disease. And what luckily we won't experience with the emerald ash borer because it turns out only 4% of the city's trees are ash, according to this inventory. We love maple. We'll normally keep putting in maple, but whenever we do tree planting, there are going to be plenty of trees that are not maple as well. Uh, we try to diversify as much as we can. Another thing ongoing is that every once in a while, uh, the overhead utility companies will hire an arborist to come through and prune the trees in the city green belt. Causes a very noticeable effect on some of our trees, which look rather um, funny, comical, and sometimes devastated after they're done. I have talked to them. There is a method to what they are doing, but we are going to be setting up a meeting with an arborist. Um, the, ma the mayor is interested <coughs> in doing a walk of some of these trees and um, trying to see if the city might be able to come to the table with a more educated stance when we deal with the utilities for future uh, utility pruning operations. Um, the city council and, and the voters of the city have uh, increased our tree removal and replacement budgets. We um, are going to make the most of that money. I'm sure we're going to spend it all between our Greenbelt program and the sidewalk and the sidewalk program. And like I said, we are tracking um, trees that are removed and trees that are added. This year, we'll put out the call for people who would like a new tree in front of their home, and we'll start building our list for the plantings in spring. I'd like to actually put that out before or in early winter because it's easier to get good pricing from installers but also get the trees you want if you order before you're in the middle of winter. This year we did even better. We were earlier than normal but still we were somewhat limited in the trees we could get. But we found a good installer who's been putting the trees out in the green belts this spring and it just so happens most of them are maple because that's what we could find. So we made a lot of people happy but you know next year we might have to be a little bit more in our so that's a good installer versus the bad installer. Well, there are um, there are installers <coughs> who will just take the tree. It's packed in clay. It's in its wire basket, and they'll kind of throw it in the ground, and then they'll water it. And what you really ought to do is there are a few different really? steps. You gotta, yeah. yeah. No, 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 Tim, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, here, I'm, let me draw it out. <laughs> didn't Wait, take him I have, a, I, have a, I have a tree out No, I, let I, me bring it in. But, but to that point, I mean, some trees have been planted incorrectly over time, and the, the lifespan is much shorter. Yeah, and then I think that, you know, we have a very active and busy public works department, and we also have to stay on top of watering those trees ourselves as a city. And, and taking good care of them. We're also looking into things that we could start doing in the winter, mostly, uh, especially for the trees in the downtown that could help them survive. Um, and uh, the trees are one of the reasons why the city removed the requirement that properties shovel and salt their own sidewalk because, so that we could start telling folks, you're not forced to salt anymore and we'd like you to salt less because that did harm some of the streetscape trees from the 2020 project. So we're doing things here and there to, to make it better. I had a couple quick questions. On uh, page two, you had the line, um, we will also explore the benefits of planning in discrete sections of the city. What, what does that mean? So this year, we, um, our Greenbelt tree planting program was west side, east side, all over the place. And um, we're going to look and see if it might make sense to start uh, coming up with a more multi-year plan where we're going to plant in this quadrant of the city this spring and then we'll plant in this quadrant of the city the next spring and, and just so we'll be able to tell folks who want a tree look one's coming we're, get, we're going to get there but we can only plant so many in a given year and we're going to get more strategic and, and that means that the installer doesn't have to mobilize all over the city it also helps with the watering program it means our water cart guys don't have to drive all over the place to get water to those new trees right and Don, this might be for you. Doesn't Rotary have a uh, program for planting trees? 
So I thought local rotary or international? The local club? Local club, yeah. I thought that was shared with me at one point. I have a meeting set up with Alan Shannon of the Rotary to talk about that, okay. actually. So if, if they don't help us with this year's planning, we'll talk to them about helping with next year's. Okay. Any other questions for Chip? Why is there such a lack of trees along Federal Street? No green belt. On one side, anyway. Yeah, it's... That hasn't stopped us in other places. <laughs> because, you know, I think if th there are actually many trees in the Federal Street corridor project in the plans. And um, if we uh, find that we need to plant some trees before we're able to fund that project, then we will. There are... Uh, there's an amazing lack of trees on Lower Weldon. If you look at the map... Yeah, it's pretty stunning. The last map with the blue symbols, there are many places in the city where... We could plant trees. Yeah. So we have a lot of work to do. If you look at if you look at federal from Aldis to Lower Newton on the west side, it's all dirt, yeah. continuous driveways. I mean, there's no there is no place to plant a tree. At least there's no green belt. We have been talking to property owners about restoring some of that green belt when we do that sidewalk, and that would be an opportunity on the on the west side. On the west side. Will there be curb on the west side? That ideally, that would be the plan, yeah. So I just want to hit a, upon a few of these, um, just because uh, I thought a few of them stand, stood out, um, especially since I live on the west side of the city. Uh, Cedar Street has have three trees in the green belt, and there's room for 61 more. So 60, there's room for 64 trees, there's three. Uh, Pearl Street, there's 25 trees. There's room for 61 more. Walnut Street, there's only 14 trees. That's another pretty long street. Uh, there's room for 66. Some of the other ones, Finn Ave, there's zero trees in the green belt. There's room for 27. Hodges Court, zero. There's room for 13. I mean, just, I, I really, I, is there a way we can put this, like, on the, on the front page of our, uh, webs our website just so people can go and look and see the work that needs I mean yeah people are like yeah I need a tree well there's thousands of trees right thousands of places for trees right now though we don't have a policy um, staff would like to focus unless there's a new guidance, new form of guidance and policy from the city council, we're going to focus on folks who, who request trees who specifically want them. There are many places where we've actually tried to put a tree, but the property owner says they don't want it for various mm -hmm. reasons, so we've, we've moved on. We're not going to have that, you know, we're not going to have that conflict at this time. And, and like you said, there are plenty of places that need trees, and there are plenty of places where the property owner also wants the tree. So that's, that's where we'll focus now. I think we need to have a good way to communicate with property owners because if we just put it in one spot and they miss that, they're not going to get it. So I don't know if we could put a little slip in their water bill or something that says, hey, you know, we're talking about planting trees. You know, just a little piece of paper. We're talking about planting trees. If you're interested in a tree to be planted in your green belt at no cost or little cost, please contact us. Sure. We're still at the embryonic stages of this though you know the, the the reason there's so many on the east side i think it's from dr carmola, carmola yeah. you know uh and so the city really didn't have a tree budget until two or three years ago and it's pretty much been following the sidewalk program around yeah uh, so well i think the west side i mean i can think of some of the trees down there they were just so old i mean it's just and when and like you said they plant them underneath the the power lines and these big huge trees underneath the power lines and you butcher half the tree and next thing you know it's leaning towards a house and I, I think that's why a lot of the trees on the west side you know they just never got replaced they just got axed just because they get so large so as we ramp up the funding we can begin to have the policy discussion of do we want to you know repopulate some of the denuded areas uh, or what are the objectives but you know once we can figure that out from the council, then we can do some outreach, but we haven't even gotten there yet. Mm -hmm. um, so the other thing that um, we could think about as we, as we look towards the interaction with the utilities is, um, it might be where Tim and I have talked about this, doing some, some research about how to um, 
bolster our bargaining position with Green Mountain Power instead of just being in a reactive mode as they come in. You know, there might be some things that we could do, you know, via an ordinance or via an MOU or via a contract even, mm -hmm. um, where we sort of take control of it. So, okay. Uh, the other thing is, you talk about people who might want trees. Does it make sense to, um, and maybe you've thought about this, uh, coordinating an MOU with whoever it is to take care of the tree, water the tree, so we're not we're not running around with trailers of water. I mean, if, if I had a tree playing out in front of me and you say, will you take care of this and you water it? Yeah, sure, that's no big deal. Well, sure. right now, Public Works hires at least two summer workers. They, uh, they've already watered all the trees today. That, that went up over the weekend. I think that right now is probably the most cost-effective way of doing it because we have those laborers who are available to do it. But you're right, whether it's with a consultant or whether it's with city staff, we, we need to get better about watering those new trees. So we'll, we'll make sure that happens. And we have, uh, my neighbor has one of those trays that go around a tree. Yeah. It blew, it blew from Houghton Park last year, last fall. Um, I can put that on my front lawn if you can have someone come pick it up. I don't know how much one of those is, but one of the black gator yeah, buckets. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yep, yeah, that will take care of that. It needs to go back out of one of those trees at Hope Park. I think they put another one on it. So oh, okay. yeah, but wherever there's another one, one that's missing it, I got it. Okay, maybe it is that one then. So yeah, those and also for this new round of trees, we're going to use a different technology. It's a plastic bag, but there are things you can put around the trees. You fill them with water, so there's a slow trickling water supply around the tree. It also prote protects the new trees from lawnmowers and weed whackers. Nope. Any other question, nope. Chip? Um, when they plant these trees, do they take into consideration where the sewer lines run to the home? Um, we, we dig safe. We're normally looking for the gas lines, and we try to make sure we don't put a tree right on top of, on top of a you know, water valve. Um, we, it's to, to do sewer line, you really need to <clears throat> go into the basement of the house and figure out where the service is inside. And they're normally deep enough that um, if tree roots are gonna become an issue for a sewer line, it's just as likely, likely from a tree next door as a tree right on top. But we, you know, if that ever needs to be excavated and we have to take out a tree to do it, it that, that would be regrettable. So we, we do our best to locate utilities and keep them away. Also, I've also heard of situations too where if, if a home has a dirt cellar versus a concrete basement, the roots eventually work their way into the basement. I can see that happening. And that, that goes back to you know basing our program right now on the people who actually request the trees. Okay. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. Okay. And one of the things we could ask, we could start asking them about, you know, Tell us about your basement. Is it tree ready? <laughs> uh, or is it too tree friendly? Um, for instance. I'm going to go home and check for roots, Marie. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Is it, yeah. you do you want a real root cellar or you don't want a literal root cellar? <laughs> no, I don't want a root cellar. Yeah. <laughs> just, I'm just curious about the type of trees we're planting along Main Street, if you know, and then what's planned for Houghton Park? What types of trees? Um, the trees we're planting right now are some of those maples. They're Armstrong Fremonti maples. On Main Street? Those, yeah, the three that we're replacing right now. <clears throat> Overall, the streetscape has had a, oh, there are all kinds of different trees that we planted, um, mostly for diversity. And uh, we've planted birches and ginkgos and uh, lindens and oaks, and it's a broad range. And um, Houghton Park, we chose trees that deal better with wet soils and will um, keep things dry and also hold things along Stevens Brook. We planted swamp oaks, tulips, um, pears, I think. Mm -hmm. And I think there's a type of maple, maybe a silver maple. There's another one I'm forgetting, a uh, hawthorn. Oh, oh, Kelly said there were like 11 different kinds of trees they planted. Oh, I don't think it was 11, 11. it was a lot. a lot. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. I think that's interesting and to support the diversity that we're going for. I feel like we could list these tree species out somewhere where people could see it. People, people are just not that familiar with anything other than maple and the value in having diverse trees around. Mm -hmm. I think it would be really yeah. worth it to kind of send that message to people. I've heard lots of people talk about the trees on Main Street. They just have no idea what they are. And so mm -hmm. they immediately think, 
well, who, who is planting these and what are they doing and why and why these particular species? Why aren't they all maple? Why aren't they all maple? You know, and they, we must be doing something really weird because they're not all maples. Um, but but I think to your point, the same, same thing you did with the um, stormwater pits with the signage. Yes. I thought you did a nice job on that, Chip. Exactly. We could make little markers for each tree. Yeah. A little, you know, educational. Yeah. Um, some educational value to that and it would help people feel an affinity for the trees. It's been done and we could look into doing that. And so just screw the plates onto the tree, you think? <laughs> <laughs> and then so sprinkle it with salt. A nice pe tight piece of wire. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions for Chip? Once again, Chip, thanks for all your work on that. Yeah. Greatly appreciated. So um, just to follow up, we were going to do the walk on um, on Friday, but it got canceled, so we're looking for another date. Oh. Yeah. My, my pet peeve, I don't know about your areas, but Tim, High Street, Messenger Street, the trees have been, I, I think, butchered pretty well. So um, just trying to look at how we might do things better. So, Tom, I'll turn it over to you for the um, loan documents, uh, we authorization of loan documents. Upstairs, I'm just looking for a motion to uh, finalize the loan documents as discussed. Motion to uh, authorize city manager to sign the redevelopment fund loan documents for redevelopment of 14 Stephen Street. Second. Any questions for Don? Hearing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Motion passes. I'm just going to note that I'm abstaining because of my personal relationship with the borrowers. Thank you, Michael. Motion to approve minute meetings uh, 4918 with a notation that I was present. It shows that I was not here. You could talk a little more, I guess, huh? <laughs> So that is a motion. Second. Second. But you you were not here for the 30th, right? I was here for the 30th. No, I was not here for the 30th. Which which ones were you? I was here for the first one. For the ninth. The ninth. The yeah. Yeah, it says you were here. It says you were here. Yeah. I 45. Huh? The meeting for the ninth, the Nine minutes for the ninth show you as present. Yep, only Jim wasn't here. Where's my name? Um, I don't see it either. No, it's just not up there as council president. Yeah. Oh, we've got Tim Smith twice. Yeah. Sorry. Okay. Phew. Okay, we're good. So, uh, motion, did someone second that? I did. Michael did. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Motion passes. Moving motion on to the warnings. Uh, 4 30, 18. Second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion passes. Abstain because I wasn't here. Abstain because I wasn't here. Two abstentions. Uh, warrants. Approval of warrants. Warrants 4918. Motion to approve. Second. Second by Kate. All those in favor say aye. 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 Motion passes. 42018. Second. Second by Marie. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? None. Motion passes. 511-18. So, uh, I have discussion on this one. Did you ever respond to all and say approved on Friday? I think so. You know what? I did it with this. And sometimes... Because I didn't get anything. I'm not going through. I didn't think about that when I did it. I, something happened where... Yeah. Okay. Do we need that? Not if the council does this. Okay. Fine then. Okay. So I think I'm, do we have a second? No. We did. I second. Okay. okay. Kate seconded. Sorry. All those in favor say aye. 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 Motion passes. No, just on uh, warrants. Chad, it's Jim and I next, right? I have no idea. I'm still going. I got it until the end of the month. Oh, you, you, you do? Yeah. I'm on, right? You're on. I don't know. Yeah, I'm still doing it with you. Yeah, you're doing it with me right now. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah, and then uh, then I think it's it's me and Jim, uh, but I didn't know what Jim's status was going to be. Good question. Or uh, I'll have Bernie follow up with you tomorrow. Yeah, there's always a backup assigned anyway, so. Hey, we should follow up, Jim. 
he might, I hear he's coming home from the hospital soon, so. Okay. Um, and he can do it remotely, so it might be okay. He was volunteer. <laughs> there, there's, there's a backup. So just check it out. <laughs> I don't know who it is, but there is a backup. Okay. Uh, did we vote on that? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yep. We're good. We're good. Okay. Mayor's report. We touched on quite a bit of it with Chip and the trees. That was um, um, has been a concern of mine. Um, other things. Um, I've received a few complaints on parking. I've shared those with Chad. Um, had a few. Com had a couple complaints on um, they were milling the South Main Street delays getting in and out of the industrial park were about 15 minutes on the first day they started. Uh, we've addressed that with VTrans. Uh, it's been much better um, and there are paving at night now so that probably um, took care of itself. Um, I think that's about all. Did you get a uh, Maple Hill School report? I did not. I got that. I thought I wasn't here for it so I didn't know if it was successful or not. Uh, it, rained? it rained on Sunday. It was to Sunday was a total washout, which is too bad. They did well that Saturday. Yes, they did well on Saturday. Yeah. Uh, probably the other thing we want to share, Chip, is we want to thank everyone for joining you and I in marching in the parade. Seeing all the sharks. Chad was there with the. That was the fastest the parade ever. <laughs> At one point, I was running. <laughs> Anyone have anything to share under other business? Um, I just wanted to say that I've received several, um, now that the weather's warming up, uh, noise complaints related to um, people driving tractors from one property a couple of blocks to get to another one that's loud and noisy, um, and also just the complaints about uh, dogs barking. Um, Josh Martin, who was here earlier, um, I'm wondering if there's something that we can do just in terms of maybe a public awareness campaign around just that the city is noisy we all live close together people have got to respect one another's uh, quality of life and it just seems like the amount of what are really neighbor to neighbor issues with noise that are coming our way as people on the council uh, has really increased in the last couple of weeks so um, I really appreciate the efforts of the police to respond to some of the more egregious uh, noise complaints that have been happening um, and city staff have been great about it but I think we as a council maybe need to write some letters talk to our neighbors do some stuff to help people understand that there's just a lot of noise in the city and it's bothering a lot of people I would love to get a conversation going about what we can do to kind of help people especially with windows open them Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, uh, I just, I can't believe how many calls I've gotten from, you know, everything from <laughs> driving the old lawnmower all the way down Bank Street and, and back multiple times a day to get from one handy site to another or, you know, the dogs just barking all day, all night uh, at other neighbors. So hmm. it's, uh, it's noisy out there. My issue is, is loud uh, motorcycles and, and cars these, with these big mufflers. It's, it just seems like more than ever. And um, it just it doesn't make for a pleasant time if you're sitting outside or you know trying to have some family gathering or something. It's just really annoying. Or at night when you're trying to sleep. Chad, you've had your share as well, right? Yep, same thing. Yep. Again, you know, we live in the city, so when people complain about the lawnmower, you know what? Someone's upkeeping their property. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, you're going to complain about the, the, the tall the tall grass, you're going to complain about the lawnmower. Pick your poison, really, you know? I think the issue wasn't so much a lawn being mowed as it was the uh, lawnmower being used as transportation long distances between properties. So that was <laughs> the first. That was just one of, one of many calls I've gotten, and I thought that was one of the... Uh, the, the more creative ones I hadn't heard. <laughs> Can you put a blurb on the uh, Facebook page to sort of touch on that piece of it? What's the message the council would like to make? Shh. <laughs> <laughs> I, th I think Mike said it good. You know, 
Living scary. in the city, it is going to be loud, but try to respect your neighbors when possible. Yeah. Something to that effect. You can work on something. Yeah. That's a tricky message. And if your dog, if your dog's barking, bring them in. Acknowledge the fact. Yeah. You know, I'm, you know, maybe we could even do like a, uh, like a checklist or something, like a quick little, you know, maybe even make it humorous, you know, like a. Yeah, we you know. get you guys to do like a singing PSA. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this is a great idea. Hey, to see that. <laughs> Be careful what you wish for. <laughs> yeah. I'm I'm uh, I'm I'm seeing a script. And, you know, there's a there's a video, and it's like open up on the sun's rising in St. Albans, and then it's just me with the biggest lawnmower in the world, just like pulling the ripcord, like a dog, you know. Sun, Sunday morning, the dog's barking, the lawnmower's going. Yeah, Stephanie's following around with a leaf blower. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's what I'm talking about. Um, it's posted on YouTube, and then, yeah, we could have a lot of fun with this. <laughs> but I think just you know, I don't, I don't think people are are trying to drive their neighbors nuts. But there's a little bit of that going on, and if, if we can do something to just could channel, uh, could public access help us with some uh, filming, filming, you know, and and, uh, and maybe always, you know, coming around to the a neighbor having a conversation with another neighbor to, yeah. to finish it off because I think people get so um, out of the habit of talking to their neighbors and are more quick to call Mike or I or whoever um, call city count city manager you know and say rather than going to the neighbor and saying it's great that you want to mow your lawn could you wait until 8 a.m. just because the baby's still sleeping you know what I mean yeah yeah okay any other business? The only one, go ahead, Kate. Um, on Green Up Day, I had a lot of discussion from people in Ward 5 again about the tractor trailer truck traffic on Upper Wildman Street. So I had thought that it was getting a little better. I don't know why, but I definitely heard it from some folks loud and clear again that there's too much. Uh, upper Wildman? Mm -hmm. uh, full tractor trailer? Full tractor trailer trucks come down our street. Oh, coming down. Yeah, well, they go both ways. <laughs> So the idea we've had here is to use the message board uh, at the top. Um, we need permission from St. Albans Town to do so, because mm -hmm. that's where the turnaround spot is, you know, and Tim, maybe you and I can connect. Um, One of the guys on my street, and I can't remember his name, but he was saying that he knows Carrie very well and the folks from town administration, and he was gonna talk to them as yeah. well and just kind of plead the case from a resident standpoint. For message board yeah to put that up but also the idea of um, a permanent sign that would say no truck traffic no through traffic because we talked about the possibility of an ordinance change that would make that yeah. street um, not passable by tractor trailer trucks so that they could be ticketed be curious to know where they're going I mean are they just cutting off Fairfield Street because that traffic has backed up so far they're cutting off some street, and they're not going to Bob's, is what I have figured out. Some of them are coming down Lower Weldon, too, so they're cutting across. People some think are coming that across it's so. a um, variety of Milan, um, maybe the hotel getting supplied with some stuff, and then the industrial park. That it's a much easier left-hand turn at the light than it is at the interstate access road. Hmm. Oh, what well, makes right. sense? More mm -hmm. easier to get into traffic. Yeah, they yeah. can yeah. stop yeah. at the light, they yeah. make their left hand turn, and it's not a problem. The interstate Whereas access is getting bad. It's is very tough at certain times. So. Oh, I would agree with that. Okay. So, anyway, I heard that a lot. Um, were you going to say something, Dom? Sorry. Well, the interstate access is supposed to be signaled uh, under Federal Street, um, which will be a great long term solution. We could put a stop sign there. That's our solution for just about everything. <laughs> <laughs> also, speed bumps. <laughs> oh, be careful what you wish for. I know. While you are going, so you two are going to talk to the town okay. about this. While you're uh, discussing that, if you can just bring one other one item up. Um, a bunch of us have lived here for a long time, and. That light that they have out 
uh, by um, um, Seymour Road. Seymour Road. I've never seen traffic on Main Street go back as far as what I what I see it now. That light just does not work right. It is uh, I travel that road all the time. I have all my life. Totally the traffic down. situation out there is absolutely horrendous. As soon as someone comes down Seymour and wants to turn left, everything else stops. That's right. It doesn't. And we, one car. And it keeps one car. Us, yeah. Someone turning with the right away. Even going right too. I think. Oh really? No, right. They at least give you like twenty. You know, ten and, seconds. Uh, the, the, the traffic goes almost all the way back to the messenger. So you, I, I'm going to tell you what people do, and my son's one of them. I'm one of them. He goes up and goes through uh, through the condo units yeah. and then down by the bank. Yeah. And that's and that's what they're using now, and it's gonna it's gonna become a problem. But it's just terrible, terrible traffic out there. I've never seen it like that ever in my life. Um, I don't know who's in charge of that. Um, I've always yeah, needed to talk to Anna, and I always forget to do it. But since you guys are gonna have the conversations, I'll, I'll let you guys. Uh, but that's really it's it's terrible, terrible uh, traffic light. Yeah, the businesses in that the immediate area must um, yeah. have a terrible yeah. time. Yeah. So when you just sit out there and truck and watch the traffic. For oh no, you tell you. Yeah. There's a few. I mean, the one out by the complex at four in the afternoon when sports are getting out or whatever. That's that's terrible. In the morning, same thing. The only, the only other one that I'd bring up is that uh, the discussion. This is nothing new, but the discussion that's coming to light is uh, merchants taking up the parking spots on Main, moving the car after two hours or two and a half. Um, some complain, some do it, some don't move, some don't see an issue with it. So it's, I don't know what the solution is, but I know that it's its making conversations quite a bit lately. So. Find just, out if it would help if we helped them get to the garage. You know, is that the issue? I, I, I'm not sure it is. One example that was shared with me was the car with the, the vehicle with advertising on it, who leaves it there most of the day. The the publicity is more than the park is worth much more than the parking uh, parking ticket. Parking ticket. Okay. Mm. Well, we could increase our, our rate. Well, that's what I thought too. Yeah. <laughs> I think they're ridiculously low. To be honest, I think ten. Ten. Yeah. Montpelier is the same. Are they 10? Yeah. You get one in Montpelier. You go to the state house, you get one in Montpelier. It's yeah. It's not a bad deal. We'll park all day for 10 bucks. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Done it many times. <laughs> Anything else? Anyone? I just got a couple quick things. Uh, uh, the owner of 17 Upper Welding contacted me. The water is coming down the sidewalk, and because the sidewalk in front of his place is kind of eroded and is dipped, it hits that dip and then it goes into his front yard and then goes into his basement. Um, and then someone else contacted me on Upper Weldon. So when uh, GMP wants to replace a pole, there's one, he has two poles in his front yard, one of them only has Comcast on it. Mm -hmm. So I don't know if we can get a Comcast. He said GMP put the new pole in, moved all their wires up, and then this pole's been just sitting there for the last year in his front yard with Do one. You an address with one. Uh, I want to say it's. I want to say it was twenty eight, but I can't remember. You had good luck a number of years ago in Rubley to get all the extra poles. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. We can chase that. One other thing, Tim. We're going to do a uh, Ward 5 block party on Memorial Day weekend. And even though you guys are from different wards, you are invited. What would be the date? It's uh, the Monday of Memorial Day, which is the 26th, 28th. 28th. Yeah. Thank you. Can all my work come so that I don't have to have them? <laughs> <laughs> yes, I suppose. A higher fee. <laughs> so yeah, Monday 3 to 6, um, we're talking about blocking a portion of the street off, which the local residents are psyched about in part because of the truck traffic. <laughs> <laughs> Quiet time. Mm -hmm. Does anyone know when Tammy's doing hers? 
I think hers is June 5th. Early June. Still in the parking lot of Food yep. City? That's yep. a good place for it. Yep. A lot of people just walk through. Anything else? Anyone? Thanks to everybody who helped with Green Up Day. Uh, things didn't. Things seemed better this year than they have in a long time. I think the incidence of picking up needles was a lot lower. Um, things just seemed nicer in the city, and man, did it look great. Um, I was in a couple of different wards because we had so many people show up in the park, but um, Brad Jenkins and the rest of the folks from the Boy Scouts just really, really helped, and there were crews from Girl Scouts and different political organizations, and it was really a great day. So, Brad did a great job organizing that. That's that reminds me, is there any way we can get someone to pick up along the railroad tracks on Marcus Street? Because that's right as you're coming into town on the train. That's like the first bit of the city you see. And I spent two hours picking up from the edge of the fence to Main Street. I mean, it was just people threw it's bags of clothes and everything else just yeah. over on the edge of the sidewalk. Yeah. So I don't know if we could have people... Maybe we could use some, uh, it sounds like on an ongoing basis, you mean? It's it's every year. I mean, my wife doesn't do Green Update anymore because she's so sick of that street. Yeah, maybe we could get some though. restorative it's justice. That, it's that street. It, I thought that I've been going by the dumpsters. The dumpsters have been better. So the dumps, it used to be because the dumpsters were just overflowing. Mm -hmm. And the dumpsters have been, I don't know if it's just where it collects because- That's the, the section right across from the dumpsters you're talking about? Yeah, I mean, that's where the fence ends, yeah. But I don't know if that's just the way the wind blows. It's just the fence or that all that stuff catches but it. That, this is the first year of the fence. Hmm. They didn't have the fence before. Hmm. I would say the other piece of Market Street, I think Allen Street is those trees all like. I that's think pretty all, good. That's what I mean. That's, that's that. pretty good. No, trash wise, but there's a lot of dead branches yeah. that can be. Yeah. But I think it's railroad property that would need to be trimmed up. We trimmed it up a few years ago. It's a little better. Yeah, city did it. That was a huge, those trees were a huge sticking point in the negotiations with the railroad, believe it or not. Oh, is that right? Yeah, yeah, they're adamant. They love them. But they, they really want them to stay. Because so. he did all their work. Okay. Anything else? Marie? No. Chad, you're good? Dave? Okay. Michael? Second. Yeah. So moved.